22, the PCR reactions completed their run, and this morning we took them out of the PCR machine. And as it states in your student protocol, we didn't have to thaw them, they came right out. We spun them down in the tabletop for two seconds to get all the liquid to the bottom. And for you, if you were here doing it, the loading solution would have been added. So Dr. Cheney and I added the loading solution. The loading solution, as you'll remember from the talk when I'm at the board, has a color in it that we can see with our eyes, a tracking dye, so we can see its progress on the gel. It also has glycerol in it, so the samples are heavier. Next, I want to take a look at the gel before I load it. So this is our gel box. We have an agarose gel in there that was poured and cooled. This is kind of a demo fakie, but to get the idea, it's like agar, but agarose is more refined. So we have a buffered solution. We put the agarose powder in, heat it up, get it all dissolved. When it cools down, we pour it into the container and we have a form we put in called a gel comb that creates the wells. So on this fake one, I can feel. What are the wells? They're openings, but they're not openings all the way through. I'll have a side picture on the board that I'll have talked about. There are wells to put your samples in. Very important, there's still agarose underneath. So you're going to put your sample in, it's going to stay there. It's not going to come out the bottom of the gel, go into the running buffer, and be lost forever, which would be very sad. So the wells I'm going to load the samples into. And I check from by looking at it from the side to make sure that the running buffer is up above the gel. So there's a chamber on each end for running buffer, and there's running buffer going across above the gel. So now I'm going to use the pipettes to load the samples. We've laid them out in order of how they're going to be loaded and we've made note of how they're going to be loaded. Very important so that when we look at the gel, the results, we know what's in each lane. So each well will be referred to as a lane on the gel. We've got nine samples to load and ten wells. So I'm skipping the first one. I'm starting with well number two and I'm putting in the first sample. So I'm Sucking up the blue liquid. Oh, I want to load all of it. Oh, yeah. This is the one I expected to be a little large in volume. Okay. So it's nice. It's nice and colored. Now, because I'm not a rookie, I'm okay with that air bubble down there. But I am going to come down here with steady hands. I've got my elbow on the countertop. I want to get rid of the air bubble, at least most of it. Now I'm going to put the tip of the pipette into the well and slowly squirt the sample into the well. If you see that little cloud, some of it didn't go in the well, but it's okay. A little blue cloud in the running buffer. If you want to get the most liquid in your wells, you want to load slowly. Okay, first sample's loaded. Oh, and I didn't skip number one as I said I would. That's okay. They're still going to load them in the same way. Second sample, I'm sucking it up. Got it in the tip of the pipette. Now I'm going to go into the second well. Looking a little better. Mm, 
Okay, that's two. There's some cloudy stuff that went in the running buffer, but it's okay. We should have enough of our sample in there so that we will be able to see the PCR product, if there is a PCR product. Okay, I am now loading the last sample, so we brought you back in for that. It's looking a little reddish purple to me, but that's because we had the dyes in our reagents for the PCR reaction. Okay, so now samples are loaded. There is some color in the running buffer, that's okay. I've laid down the tubes in the order I loaded, so I can double check that I actually loaded them in the order I meant to. Now, to run the gel, let me put the lid on, which is going to make the proper connections. We want to have the anode at the end closest to the wells, cathode, far away. DNA has the net negative charge, so once we plug this in and we have current, the DNA is going to move toward the cathode. All right, so now I'm plugging it into the power supply. Everything is color-coded here, so if I follow the colors properly, it should be good. All right, we're on checking that we are good. We want to run, I don't remember off the top of my head what the protocol said. Oops, I want to keep it there. I want to turn here. I like to be in the 90s. So we're going to run it in the 90s and it should be on volts. Okay, so we're at 98 volts. Now I'm hoping we can show on the camera, I always check, I'm gonna move some stuff out of the way. There's a little platinum wire at each end. And we'll see if we can catch on camera little bubbles. Here we got the label. I don't know if you can, I see little bubbles right there. And then down here, so the platinum wire comes down and goes across. If there's bubbles, we've got good connections. I'm looking down at the other end and seeing bubbles. The bubbles look like a reverse waterfall. The bubbles are coming up. So that says our connections are all connecting. Second safety measure is to actually watch for a while. And you can see, so you just may video in on that. The tracking die is visible to us. The tracking die should be moving towards the red and the tracking die is going to move into the gel and once it's completely in the gel then the wells will not have any color. So that visible tracking die lets us know what's going on. We can't see our DNA samples, right? They're microscopic, but we can see the tracking die. And, because I'm not a rookie, I can see they're moving in the right direction. We may lay, let it run a little bit more and then we'll come back and show you when the wells are empty. And then we can take some shots as it's running. We're going to run these tracking dies about, I'll have to check my notes, but maybe a good 50% of the way down the gel in order to separate the size bands that we want to separate and see on the gel. Now you can clearly see that the wells are looking empty. The tracking dies moved into the gel and it's moving toward the red cathode, so it's moving in the correct direction. And there's even a little space in front of the well. So that tracking die is going to continue to move. We'll watch it. Typically we run the gel about 45 minutes to an hour. 
this would be day two of PCR, but you're getting it all in one video. On day two, the first thing we would do, and you've already watched this, would be to load and start running our on roast gel. So now that our on roast gel is running, I want to talk about on roast gel electrophoresis, go over that a bit, and talk about our gel, and then we're going to get to the results of this experiment. Okay, so agros gel, I'm going to write out the whole word here, electrophoresis. So that's the proper way to talk about running a gel. So running a gel is kind of like jar. What are we actually doing? We're doing agros gel electrophoresis. As I mentioned, agaros is similar to agar, more refined. We use a buffered solution. Basically, the gel is like a very firm piece of gel. But specially, wells. So here's a side view. Oopsie, there we go again. I'm a little dyslexic sometimes. Side view the gel. So from a side view, this is what a well would look like. I have to erase that line. So this is all agaros. This is an opening that we squirted our samples into. So from the side, we deposited, I deposited, our sample. So we got our sample in our well. Okay? Now from the top, all the samples were loaded, and it looks something like this. Now, I didn't talk about this when I loaded, but you might have noticed I loaded them not left to right, but right to left. Because this is the way we're gonna look at the gel and look at our results. And in my picture, I've just got seven lanes. So I loaded the other direction so that when we look at it now, number one will be on the left and the highest number will be on the right. Once each sample was loaded into the wells, we connected it, watched to make sure that it's running in the right direction, that the DNA, which has a net negative charge, is gonna be running this direction because the cathode is at the far end of the gel box away from the wells. So the anode was at the other end of the gel box. Negative repels negative and negative is attracted to the positive. While it's running the little bits of DNA that are in our, in our sample enter the gel. And how does agarose gel electrophoresis work? The gel is a matrix. But first, I haven't told you, what are the two reasons we're doing agarose gel electrophoresis? Number one, it's going to separate DNA fragments by size. That's what agarose gel electrophoresis does. Number two, it's going to enable us to see or visualize the DNA fragments in our samples. Okay, so two things. Separate the DNA fragments by size. and allow us to visualize our DNA fragments, okay? As the DNA is moving towards the cathode, it's got to wiggle through the matrix that is the agarose gel. And the smaller fragments are going to move faster. They're going to wiggle through that matrix faster. So smaller fragments, and they're going to look like bands, they look like the shape of that well, 
at different sizes, let's just say there's a bunch of different sizes here. The bands that migrate the furthest are the smaller DNA fragments. The bands that migrate the least far are the largest DNA fragments. So that's the separating by size. On our gel, we loaded a DNA marker, a DNA size marker. Hmm, I erased too much on the board, but that's okay. The DNA size marker has three bands that are much bigger than what we're looking for. 6.7 KB, 3.6 KB, and 2.8 KB. What the heck is a KB? One kilobase, which is equal to 1,000 base pairs, really. What are base pairs? Rungs of the DNA ladder, okay? So if you've got one kilobase size DNA fragment, it's got 1,000 rungs. So those are all bigger, and then we have ones closer to what we're looking for. We got a 1.5 KB, 1.1 KB, and 0 0.82, 0.63. So in one well on the gel, we're going to see three bigger bands, then some space, and then we're going to have four of the smaller bands. Okay. When you run an Andros gel, you always run a size standard on it. That way you compare your bands to bands of known sizes, and you can check, or even more precisely, if you use a graph, size the DNA band that you're seeing in your sample. We are not gonna precisely size Today, we are going to just check that if we see bands, we're expecting them to run right about at this level. Okay? Because this is 1.1 KB. Some of you might remember from the protocol that our PCR fragment we're looking for, our PCR product, is 1 KB. Our PCR product is one kilobase, 1,000 base pairs. Now, I jumped right into all of this agros gel electrophoresis without giving you a refresher on PCR. So I'm going to give you the refresher on PCR now. Okay, and it's going to be brief. PCR. 3 P steps. We've got the melting. What's the fancier word for that, Dr. Cheney? Denaturation. Denaturation. We've got the annealing. Is there another word for that? Extend? No. Okay, we got extension. I'm sure I've got an extra letter in annealing, I apologize. Extension or synthesis. So remember, we put DNA sample in. We put the specific primer specific for a region of E. coli BAD1 in. We put our TAC polymerase in. We put nucleotides in. And we put buffers and cofactors, anything to make our enzyme work well. Put those all in the tube, do the PCR reaction, which is doing these steps over and over and over again. Oops. 94 degrees Celsius. We're melting apart the strands, the double strand of DNA to make a single strand. We drop down, I don't remember the exact temp for this, but you saw it in the video. Let's say it's 56 degrees Celsius. Cool, primers bind. 
So the primers that are in excess are going to bind if they find the region they'll bind to. Then we take it up, the machine takes it up to 72 degrees. And now what's happening? DNA synthesis. Now, it's been tested. Once you get to 30 to 35 cycles, the amount of your product, your PCR product, plateaus. So typically reactions are done for 30 to 35 cycles, maybe two hours, and stopped because you basically reached your maximum amount of product. So the PCR is the magic wand. If we get PCR product, it'll be in vast excess compared to the sample DNA. So if those primers found their target to bind to, our PCR tube at the end is this. It's PCR product. The sample, it's like nothing compared to how much PCR product we have now. And the PCR product we're looking for is a DNA fragment specific for that one, that nasty strain of E. coli. So the reaction tubes, hopefully, have all done their PCR reactions. We're loading them on the gel to both size the PCR products and visualize our PCR products. The PCR product size we're expecting is 1 kb. So when we look at a picture of a stained gel, we're going to be looking for 1 kb PCR product. Now, DNA is still naked, even after you run the gel. You can see the tracking dye, you can't see the DNA. So a step that you're not seeing done was to stain the gel with ethidium bromide. So seeing it, we used ethidium bromide for short. Ethidium bromide is a carcinogen because it likes to bind to DNA molecules. So only the instructors deal with it. So the gel that we're going to move to and show you the picture of the results has been stained with ethidium bromide. So the DNA bands now have the ethidium bromide in there, any DNA bands on the gel. And when we put the gel on the UV light box, turn on the UV lights, ethidium bromide glows. So you shine UV light on it, and it glows. It's kind of a pink orange glow. I would say more orange. What it really looks like is, you know, we're going to see on the picture. Pictures don't always have the colors exactly like you expect. Okay, we are back to take a look at the gel. First, I want to show you the side view. The purple tracking dye you can see is moved down towards the middle of the gel. There's an orange tracking dye. I forgot that was in there. It was in there with the kit. That's running ahead of the purple tracking dye. Now we're gonna see what we can see from the top. I unplugged and took the lid off. Try to avoid glare here. You can see the wells are on the left. You can see the track tracking dye, both the purple blue and the orange. And I think the gel has most likely run far enough. So the next step would be to take the gel out of the gel box and stain it with ethidium bromide. Once it's been stained with ethidium bromide, we can see the DNA in the gel. The gel box is disconnected from the source, so we're safe here. Agarose gels can be fragile depending on the percentage. This one's pretty sturdy. Remember, think about thick jello like we do with the agar that's in the petri plates. 
So I've got the gel on the spatula and now I'm gonna walk over to the light box. Okay, this is our UV light box. The ethidium bromide, which will stick to the DNA and effectively be our DNA stain, is in the gel. So all of this stuff is touched ethidium bromide, so I have to be careful with it. The light box has a cover that goes down that blocks UV radiation. So I wanted you to see the gel on the UV light box. And, yeah, I'm going to turn the lights on just so you can see what the UV lights look like on there. There we go. Can you see the purple? I don't expect you to see anything of the gel, but I just wanted to give you the purple of the UV lights. That's it. From here, we'll go to pictures of stained gels to check out the results. All right, I have here a picture of a stained gel. You may figure out, so I'll go ahead and tell you. This isn't the exact gel that we loaded because the size marker is not in the middle and we don't have four lanes on either side, but it's okay. I will explain to you how the samples were loaded on this gel. So first off, I want you to know you can just barely see well, the wells are at the top of this image. So this is lane one, lane two, lane three, lane four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lanes. On this gel, obviously this is the size marker. These are the larger bands. We don't really care about those, but I want to go over the sizes of the smaller bands that we do care about. So this band is 1.5 kb. This band is 1.1 kb. Here we're at 0 0.82, 0 0.63. So the separation depends on how long you ran the gel. We ran the gel enough to get nice separation between those bands. We're expecting a PCR product at 1 kb. These lanes here are the positive and negative controls. You've always got to have positive and negative controls so that you know if your reagents worked and the PCR reaction worked. So our positive control, control lane, do we see a band that's consistent with being a 1 kb band? Yes. Negative control, no band. Great, so it looks like our reagents were good. Now, before we get to the other side, to our hospital worker samples, I do want to talk about these because you couldn't help seeing them. They're running low on the gel, okay? We're significantly below the 630 base pair level. These sometimes show up in PCR products didn't show up in the size standard, but only in the PCR product well. It's called primer dimers. If the PCR conditions aren't fully optimized, you can see the primer dimers. So this tells me the conditions of that we ran the PCR were not fully optimized, but did it work well enough for us to get results? Yes. So please ignore these fuzzy bands that are small. So going back to the positive control, we see our PCR product of the expected size, negative, no product. We have hospital worker A, hospital worker B, hospital worker C, hospital worker D. All right, we've got primer dimers in all the lanes. We have a positive, for the E. coli BAD1 specific DNA fragment right here for worker A. Negative for B, negative for C. We have a positive reaction again with worker D. Now you might be wondering, what are these pink fuzzy things up here? 
It could simply be that there is so much of this fragment, if it's overloaded, things don't run properly. So I'm not concerned about this. I would call it an artifact of the gel. And if, say, we were publishing the gel, I would probably crop it, the picture, so you didn't see the primer dimers. And be tempting to crop that out. But actually, you'd probably just want to print the gel. So PCR products. So for this particular experiment, we did our PCR reactions. We ran the reactions on a gel to separate by size, stained with ophidium bromide so we could actually see them, check the size, and this is our result, okay? The research is finding the primers that are specific to that bad strain, right? So scientists cannot just whip up these tests overnight. We now have the sequence of this new coronavirus. So we have sequence information. So that we could be doing PCR tests for the new coronavirus. Now I want to also mention that when PCR testing or DNA testing is done, a gel is not always the end result. You could take your PCR samples, send them to a DNA sequencing facility, and get the exact sequence, the A's, T's, C's, and G's of the PCR product, which would be even better. But you can take the tube that is your PCR product and sequence the DNA. In that tube, the vast majority of the DNA is the PCR product. So that will 